Hi, I'm Dr. Smiley and I'm Dr. Craig Pearson. I'm a dentist, a cranial architect, and Dr. Pearson. I'm an, a chiropractor, specializes in sacro-occipital technique, and I'm a craniopath. We are here because of this guy. We share a common ground, a denominator, or a playground, I call it the mandible and cervical spine. So what we do is we straighten up the skull bones together and solve this puzzle to make people's autonomics, um, nervous system, breathing, functioning, chewing, swallowing, and posture better every single day. Dr. Craig, want to tell a little bit about what this guy is all about. So basically what we're talking about here is, is a 22 bone moving structure that relies on the rest of the structure to actually operate correctly. So if the pelvis is not working right, it will manifest up into the cranium and distort the cranium. It can also have a descending disorder. In other words, the cranium becoming distorted as you would be in, as an infant, and then you can distort down into the pelvis so the structure will be forever offset. The body will then become anxious over time and continue as it searches a way to heal itself, become more and more anxious where it's difficult to sleep at night. Let's talk a little bit about airway. We talk about nasal breathing. We know about tongue posture. We know about high arch palate. But what I really would like the dentist to, to pay attention to is what I learned is the two bones that we're moving, well, four really, it's the maxilla, which is the roof of the mouth, and its connection to this bone that's the sphenoid. So Dr. Craig, can you tell us a little bit of the nasal structure and how it's cranially related to the way people breathe and tongue function? Just give us a little tour of this part of the skull. Well, basically what you've got here is, is the sphenoid bone, which is the central bone to the, the cranium. So at the back of the mouth, you, it actually you can, if you put your finger into the mouth here, you can actually feel, if you go all the way back to the top of the palatine, uh, top of the palate, uh, you can touch up onto these, uh, these, this part of the sphenoid bone. In front of that, you've got the two palatines and the two maxilla. Now these all have to be behave correctly because inside the, the nose here, you've got some, the, the concha bones uh, and, and the, the airflow is going to be coming right through this area. This part of the, uh, the, the nose can get quite inflamed very quickly and that's the stuffiness that you'll feel in there. So, but the, the concha bones are quite critical in that they actually act like turbines. They, they circle the air in a certain way to get the right airflow through into the, into the, uh, the passages down to your lungs. And so those, those uh, concha bones actually get the right airflow right from the beginning. So you can actually breathe quite smoothly through the nose. And so those, these structures need to be moving correctly to allow for that freedom inside there. So when they're out of alignment, the drain, there's a drainage issue out of one side of the sinus or the other. And also, if you can turn this around the camera, Dr. Craig, right here at the back of the palate when he was showing, this part, this orange part, that's not the maxilla. And mm -hmm. that is directly in the middle of the nose. We know it to be the middle turbinate, superior turbinate that's connected to the maxillary Well, sinuses. these are two palatines, yeah. Right. Two, yeah. And that is the real state where the real nasal breathing benefit comes from. Pulling the nitric oxide from the sinuses, filtering, humidifications. So if there's any malalignment of these two bones because of the sphenoid, which we can see in the face, that will not drain properly. So when we see a deviated septum, that tells me that body on one side quite cannot get that airflow filtration and one part of the nose is not working. So when they have sinusitis, polypal tissue in their sinus, in their nose, it's because of the malalignment of these bones. When we, we correct the, the alignment of those bones and release those fascial tissue, they can nasally breathe better. Right, and it will also imply that the reciprocal tension membranes yes. aren't, uh, aren't under the correct tension, and so that then can distort anything within the cranium including the pituitary, exactly. which is inside the, which nestles inside the uh, cella turcica, which is part of the sphenoid bone. Palmer College, so I know a number of chiropractic techniques, but I focus a tremendous amount on SOT. SOT, sacrum to occiput. So therefore the sacrum is reflecting into this purple bone here, the occiput. And the ilia will reflect into the temporal bones either side. So the SI joint, the sacroiliac joint, will then reflect into the occipital temporal bone. And then what is interesting about this, you've got a single hinging uh, mandible on two moving separate temporal bones. So if the pelvis is off down below, it's going to create a distortion into the, the base of the cranium here. And that's going to create a distortion where the hinging uh, jaw will not hinge correctly on either temporal bone. Which is why they come to see the dentist for TMJ problems. So I knew when they have a TMJ problem, they have a locking, clicking, things like that. 
I knew 100% of the time the problem was there in their pelvis. Correct. And so the, the patient comes in, they don't believe that it comes from the pelvis. We start fixing the pelvis and they're amazed as they lie on the okay. table and feel the pressure come and off I'm the jaw. I'm amazed. I don't even need as much appliance therapy to get my patients to feel better. And once they start growing their mouth and doing my dental orthopedics, it's so much predictable. So I'm going to look at the face. The face can give you all the clues because what happens is, I'm going to give an example. I love analogies. You know those blinds in the, in the, um, that we cover in our, in, our, in our house? So when you pull the string on the blinds, the, all the blinds are going to shut together. So we see those bones. So think about those blinds as all these bones, especially this part of the skull that moves a lot. If you bite on something hard, this bone, the temporal bone, moves quite a bit. If I actually kind of take this guy apart, I can show you that it moves just about a good centimeter as a shock resorbing factor. Thank God we have that, otherwise we would break a tooth. So why, why is our system designed that way? Just so that our body or our brain can control our head over our hip bones. So what that means is the little strings that I was referring to is something called reciprocal tension membrane. This is a term that Dr. Pearson told me about, which is the control, the neurology or that fascia that controls position of the bones on top of the hip. So if you have an instability in a hip bone or a pelvis, your body will do everything to avoid loading that. So it will shift your head to one side and it will lock up and affects the other side temporomandible joint. So when I see a patient's jaw go to one side, my question is, where is their hip? Why is their body avoiding that side? It's the job of our lower jaw is to guide our body to left or to the right as we, as we basically move and swallow. So this is a communication between our head and our body. So if this guy goes to one side, this is the dial that tells me why is the body avoiding one side and why is this guy moving the entire body mass to the other side. So then I go into the question of the two bones that hold it, which I refer to, the temporal bones, the hip bones, the pelvic bones, and the head. Why are those two out of order? And what, why is that string pulled and they shut over the condyles? When I was, a, was just doing dentistry and I only understood TMJ from the teeth, I was always told that the condyle moves within the fossa. But what you taught me is fossa moves over the condyle. And that changed the way I looked at dentistry. And I knew that a chiropractor without that part of the understanding of the whole body as a whole is impossible to guide this 32 teeth into the right position for a body that owns it. So what we noticed with, so Dr. Zmaili noticed that uh, there was something happening in your face. And so I drew the, the picture downward and said, this is what's probably going on. So what I find is when I'm looking at somebody, I can see the distortion, but I'm looking primarily at the body, not so much the face. So in our practice, what people do is that they get up in the morning and they look at their face. So when they notice things are going wrong, they'll probably notice in their face that something's going wrong. They visit with a dentist, somebody like Dr. Smiley. She can see, oh, this is something more extensive than that, and she will then refer the person into me. What I will I notice is that when this issue is part of the pelvis, all the issues of the body are going to be one-sided. So you're going to start to notice things going up the structure from one side. So you might, it'll be the right, let's just say for example, the right side of the pelvis is going to be on the right side of your cervical spine. It's going to be right shoulder, it could be right arm, right knee, right foot. It's always going to be on one side. Uh, then it switches, can shift to the other side when it gets into the cranium the, in the jaw. But what we'll also notice will be a tremendous amount of tightness between the shoulder blades. So the latissimus dorsi is now reacting to a failing pelvis, and so it anchors into the, between the, the shoulder blades, and so you'll get tightness in the shoulder blades. It then pulls the shoulder down, trapping the thoracic outlet, and so now you can get symptoms into the arm. From there, it can shift into the, the, the cervical spine, and then ultimately it's dragging the system down and, and those reciprocal me tension membranes that you mentioned are now becoming distorted within the cranium, and so you see the cranial distortions. Which is why the dentists are the ones that see all of this first and they hear all the symptoms, they don't know what to do with. What we talked about is the face has all the clues that the problem, the solution is not in the mouth. What the dentist is trying to do with the temporomandible joint is always the problem is in the pelvis. And until the pelvis is stabilized and what I call the nuts and bolts are tightened up, the body will not allow you to completely put those 22 bones in the correct place, which is why a lot of patients will not resolve with the treatments that dentists do with TMJ. So what do we do? 
we go back to the drawing board. Why is the pelvis unstable? How do we get the curvature in the spine in the correct place and free up the bones in here so that we can align them?